Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Launch Network. This is Carmine Tedisco, your co-host for today's show of Get Retail Ready with my friend, the man of the hour, Mr. Jim DeBetta. What's going on, Jim? Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, it's a chilly start here to the day in Atlanta. We had some like mid-20s temps this morning, and it was raining all day yesterday, so there was this whole you know black ice warnings and everything, but it's like it's uh it's like it's clearing up wow. so hopefully we'll uh we'll get past all that but other than that you know we had the, the holiday yesterday so a lot of people that have been quiet other than that though it's business as usual yeah yeah you know i was up in atlanta and uh, i was surprised because i thought you know with the virus a lot of people work from home but you guys have some traffic up there man you got some cars you know what it is i don't think that when they designed the roads for this city like 30, 40 years ago that they thought it was going to grow this much. And so there's a lot of, there are a lot of roads, like 75, there's like six lanes on that thing, but it's always crowded. I think because there's just not a lot of great ways sometimes to get off and get onto other things. And they, they're constantly building and altering and fixing here. So I've been here 15 plus years. There are certain roads here that they are just constantly changing. But yeah, I don't think that they, ever thought that there'd be millions and millions of people here. And so they're now sort of working backwards to fix things and make them so they're more usable. I, I don't know, but yeah, it definitely, I mean, coming from New York, I didn't think there could be anything worse, but it's actually worse here than I think it is up there because up there you only have a few main roads, but people, they're there and they know how to navigate them. Here it's constantly changing. Yeah. Well, the city is nice. There's a lot to do in Atlanta, even things that I didn't know about, you know, so it was kind of cool. I, I mean, I like the yeah. city. There are, there's, um, I mean, there are, I mean, you've got, I mean, you have sports, although you can't really go to any games, but I mean, you've got right downtown, you've got Falcons, the Hawks, you know, they're right there. You get the Braves, the Braves were really up more by me. It used to be more downtown. They moved that up here to the suburbs. Well, yeah, you've got a lot of restaurants and there's hotels and there's shopping and there's malls and there's museums. This this enough to do if somebody wants to come up here and spend a long weekend for sure. Yeah, it was cool. I liked it. I, it, I mean, I liked it. Like I said, I think that I was bugged about the traffic because I really obviously didn't know how to get around as good. So, you know, I make a turn and it's a one way. I'm all pissed off. But yeah, it's you not really that. the city's and fault. You know? <laughs> New York's like that, too. Yeah. But it's like every other street is like a one way street. So you kind of know where they are here. They just pop up. You're like, oh, my God, like, look, I'm on this one way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, crazy. So, but cool, man. So, so what do you got going on? I mean, and, uh, I know that we usually talk about some of the products that you have um, at the end, but we'll, you know, real quick, what's what's happening with you? Well, we've got a few things. I actually started working with a product, and it's called COVIDopoly. So basically, it's it's a monopoly game, monopoly, but for COVID, for Corona. And you open up the board; it's got just all Corona related stuff on it. So we're starting to work with that. That's kind of fun because it's so timely and we talk about inventors coming up with timely products for things, but just starting to get that out there and see if we can get it landed. It doesn't seem like Corona is going away anytime soon. So it might have an opportunity for like this fall or holiday. So that's one of the good fun things that we're trying to see if we can get out there. That's funny, man. I love it. Yeah, and that is a timely product, no doubt. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And then I have another one called Body Warmer. This person, an inventor, he's a guy, Mike from Baltimore. I worked with him literally like 15 plus years ago when he first invented this. Basically, think of it as suspenders for that like you, you wear and they, they're chargeable and you charge them up for a few hours and then you put them on and they're heating strips. So if you're doing anything outdoors, they keep you a little bit warmer. But now the product's evolved and it, it looks more like a lanyard. And he came back to me a few months ago after not hearing from him for a long time. We actually got the product placed at Sportsman's Guide 15 plus years ago. And it, it didn't do great, but I think it was just sort of clunky at the time. But Mike has now reinvented his own invention. And we're just starting to see if we can get that out to all the sporting goods stores and everybody else. Cool, man. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, it's, it's yeah, funny so when fun people stuff. reinvent you know, they make sure that, uh, you know, their own invention. Yeah. That's, yeah. you know, so, but he's, he understands that it, it needed to be better. It needed to be lower priced. 
you learn lessons, unfortunately, the hard way sometimes the first time, but he definitely made a, a go at it to make it better the second time around. So hopefully we have a, a better result with it. Cool. Yeah, it's yeah. always fun to see that. All right. So we are going to pick up uh, where we left off from last week. As you know, we get endless questions from people. A lot of them are the same. And so we want to cover a few more of the most common questions that inventors ask. Because even since last week, I'm still getting the same questions. So I figured let's let's keep rolling on that. And the, the number one of all of these questions that we get, unlike some of the questions that we only hear so you know once in a while, is should I license or bring the product to market myself? I know you get that one mm -hmm. all the time. And my first reaction is, where are you in your life? What are you doing? Do you have a career or a job that takes up your days? Do you want to be in business for yourself? Are you at retirement age where you can actually do this if you want to do it? And a lot of people just don't understand the differences and the risks and rewards. I mean, do you get that question a lot? Yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, it's one of the first things that I ask really, if they don't bring it up because it just, it will put you on a different path. Like I don't want to talk with somebody for two hours about manufacturing and prototyping and all the things that it takes. If in reality, they're looking to license or in that position in life that they really should license. So it's one of those uh, questions that I ask right up front and I kind of ex try to explain both ways or both paths. Yeah. And I get people that they, they're confused. They say, well, Jimmy, I've got a product and I want to license it to a retailer. And I don't think that they even understand what that means. I have to go back and say, listen, you don't license to a retailer, you sell products to a retailer. So you make it at a factory and then you package it. And then you call on that retailer and you sell them the product and they resell it to people like us who walk in their stores. So they, so they're confused. And, and I'm, I tell them that licensing is when you approach a company. So if you have a pet product, we would approach a pet company and you would lease your intellectual property or your patent rights over to this, man, this company, this brand. So if you have a pet bowl, uh, we would approach a company that sells pet bowls and say, hey, we've got this idea. And I'm leaving out all the details of how, how you do a licensing agreement. But in essence, if you strike a licensing deal with that pet bowl company, they're going to do all the manufacturing and the selling and the marketing for you. And you're going to receive a royalty, usually 3%, 5%, somewhere in that range generally, in exchange for lending them, and I'm doing air quotes there, lending them your patent rights so they can go out and manage that part for you. So that's a case where somebody doesn't want to be in business for themselves. They'd rather have somebody do it for them but of course, they're only going to get, so to speak, a few bucks for every hundred that get sold versus doing it on your own where, hey, you're going to be in your own business. You're going to take a lot more risk, a lot more financial risk, but you stand to make a lot more money usually for every product that you sell. Yeah. You know, it's one of those things where the financial side is super important. You know, it, it really is to me. To any inventor, we, we want to make money. There's nothing wrong with talking about, you know, wanting to make money for your idea and selling it. But, and I don't know if you get this as often as I do, but a lot of times when someone wants to license, they still don't want to let go of their idea. They still want to be um, part of decision-making. They still want people to know it was their idea. And, and I want to let license, you know, people that want to license know that, that you won't get any of the credit <laughs> for the licensing if you license your idea. And, and if it's just where you want to, you know, get your product out there and you want to make some money, you have to take the emotion out of it, right? Licensing companies uh, are very seldom are going to allow you to have any kind of say in, in what they do as soon as they take over your product. Yes. We talk about passion versus emotion all the time. And when you do license, you are relinquishing your role, your rights to a degree completely over to this company. And so if you do have pride in having your name attached to it, or you want your story to be told, or you want to be involved and, and have the spotlight, licensing might not be the thing for you because you are giving this task, all these tasks over to somebody else. That's what a lot of people want. They just say, hey, I always have ideas for things. I have ideas for this, I have ideas for that. 
and they're constantly coming up with stuff so fast and so quick that they they probably couldn't even manage running a business on their own because the ideas are usually not in the same realm of products. So it's not pet products. It's, they have a pet product and a housewares product and a consumer electronic product and they have a, an accessory and they have a clothing idea or whatever else. Those are things to license, but you're going to basically disappear. The company's going to take over. They're going to do everything. And then when they start selling it, you get your few percent in the form of a royalty. People, there are a lot of inventors that love doing that. They'd rather just come up with ideas, file for patents, and pass the whole thing off to somebody else versus yeah. setting up a business, prototyping, manufacturing, shipping, marketing, sales. They don't want to do all that stuff. Or they don't want to do some of that stuff. Yeah. And it is costly for sure. Yeah. So you have to understand where you are, what your goals are. If you if you just do not like, and a lot of people have careers, they're successful already. They have a job they like, and they just don't have the time. Even if they wanted to run a business around their invention, they don't have the, the opportunity to do it. So they would rather make some money from their invention versus nothing. So licensing becomes a great way. But if you want to run your own business, you want to run your own show, you're not happy with your job or career, or you're retired and, and you have time and you have the, the financial means, certainly I help people take products to market and get them developed all day long. And that is a great potential way to be successful. And your name will be out there and your story can be told and you could feel and look good about your product because your name's attached to it. So when people ask this question, what should I do? We have to go through these motions and find out really where they're at and then not make the decision for them. I never say you should, or you really need to do this or you need to do that. It's more like, here are the risks, here are the rewards, sleep on it and think about where you want to be. And if you want to do either one of those things, then we'll help you along. But if you can't decide, and people say, can I do both? Now you can do both. I, I did it in my own company. We had a sport optics company and I was selling my binoculars and other products to almost every major retailer. But then there were times when I would license certain new binocular products to other, other binocular companies or other optics companies that had different channels than I, than I sold them to. So they were selling them to, like you say, the, the government or they're selling them to the military. And I didn't sell them those channels. I just sold to retail. So if I had a new binocular, even though I could sell that particular binocular to sporting goods stores, I could still license it to a company who sells to the military. So you can do both, but that's, not the norm. The norm is you sell on your own or you license, but then once you get experience and once you get into your business, you could look to do both, but it's not a recommended thing. At least I don't think for the startup or the new inventor. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I mean, it's hard enough to go on in either direction uh, when you're first starting out, but as you do more products and as you, if you license, you know, on your third or fourth, your fifth product that you license, obviously things get easier, things get faster. Um, but if you're manufacturing, same thing. If you manufacture, um, you're after your first or second or third product, things get easier. So yeah, I agree, Jim. It's, uh, it's just, it's a learning curve, you know, and, uh, it's great that, you know, you get to talk about it. I mean, the information that you're giving away on the show is usually what people hire you to do and you're giving it away. And, you know, that's kind of, like you said, because it's the same question and there's always a new inventor every day, you, you know, people, hundreds of thousands of people wake up with a new idea. Uh, it's just great that you're giving this information out. Uh, it not only helps the people, but it also probably helps you save a little bit of time. <laughs> yeah, well, you're right. Because, you know, you don't want, you don't want to take somebody down a path that they don't understand or they don't want to go down. So yes, this is all about that managing expectations, educating people. We always say the best inventor is an educated one. So if we can give them that basic knowledge as to here are the two paths that you can usually take and here are the risks and rewards and here's what's likely to happen and here's what you could make and here's what it could cost, which is going to lead into my next most common, one of the most common questions we get. But yes, helping people along helps them to get clarity on what they need to do because once they know which path, then it's easier to say, okay, well, if you're going to license, these are the things you need to do. Or if you want to go on your own, here are the things we need to do. Yeah. So everybody wins that way because 
they get clarity. I understand what they want to do. And then I can know specifically how to help them. Yeah, that's good. And this might lead into your next question. I'm not sure uh, what the next question you were going to throw out there was, uh, but I get inventors that um, they're manufacturing, they're tweaking, they're trying to make this idea as good as possible. I don't use the word perfect, but they, but when I speak with them, they let me know that they're going to, they're looking to license and they're going down this path of manufacturing. They're doing everything. They're doing all of these things, but they believe that they have to supply the license E with a perfected product and, and, and they're going down the wrong route. Yeah, and I've had some debates on social media about this. I, I always tell people, you don't really need a prototype. You just need a great sell sheet to present to a potential licensee to get a deal done. And, and people push back and say, no, you, it, it's better if you could prove the concept. It makes it easier to, to sell the concept to a, you know, a potential licensee. And it can. It certainly can help if you have, especially if it's something that's complicated or it's got moving parts and it's a sophisticated type of product to prove that it can actually be made and mass produced can help a potential licensee to understand that. But if you're approaching a consumer electronics company with a, a consumer electronic item, they know how to manufacture, they know how to prototype, they could look at something and guess or educated guess to a great degree that this thing could probably be made. Now, does, should you perfect the prototype and make 10 iterations of it? No, I think you should at the at, at best come in with a somewhat functional or a, a good model of what that should be. And along with the sell sheet, you can present that. But there are people in our business who will stand behind what I'm saying, which is with a great sell sheet that's very clear and a, maybe a short video explaining yourself that you could absolutely get a licensing deal done because what you do is you want that licensee to pay for prototypes and refinements and manufacturing. That's why you're licensing. If you want to do all that, you might as well manufacture and sell it yourself. So it, it's not a no-no to, to prototype. It's just something you don't have to do for a lot of basic products in order to get a licensing deal. Yeah, per perfect. Exactly. Yeah. So, so there is there is that there is that balance. And that's why talking with somebody like yourself or somebody that's doing it, you know, you just don't want to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on something if you're going to try. to. No, 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 no. Again, if you're going to do that, then what are you licensing for? So that leads into the next question that I get often, or at least after they ask a couple of other questions, which is what does it cost to invent a product? What does it cost to license? What does it cost to bring a product to market? And the answer is it depends. So if you're if you're going to license the product, it really should cost you next to nothing. If you file for a patent or a provisional, uh, and, and I don't want to get into patent speak too much here because it's it'll take up the whole rest of the podcast. But if you file a provisional patent, uh, you fill out a, a provisional patent application. It's not going to get examined by a patent examiner at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, but rather it gives you a one-year time frame to claim patent pending status and to work on that invention until you can file the what we call real patent, which is a non-provisional utility patent. So, other than that cost, and that you could people try to do it themselves. I never recommend it, but you know, for you know a few hundred bucks, so to speak, you can file on your own or you could pay a little bit more and have a patent agent or attorney do it for you. Other than that, and making a sell sheet, which again, people can do on their own, or you could pay a few hundred dollars to have a graphic artist do it. If you don't need a prototype, that's all it costs to potentially get a licensing deal. You just have to then reach out to companies, you know, find them, pitch to the proper people at those companies. You can email them or call them or try to get an appointment with them and hope you get a deal. If you decide to go it on your own, it depends on the complexity of the product. It's going to cost you tens of thousands for sure. Just having prototypes made, having CAD files, you know, you know, professional drawings done of the product if they're needed. Um, per piece manufacturing, if a factory wants a minimum of a thousand pieces made and your product costs $5 each to make, you're gonna spend 5,000 just to have that made. 
and then selling it and marketing it. So I always tell people for a very simple product that doesn't move, that doesn't have batteries, um, you know, you could be twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars for sure by when all is said and done. But if you have something that's more sophisticated, that's more complicated, uh, it could be fifty to hundred grand or a few hundred grand for sure by the time everything is said and done. So it just depends on what you're doing, what the product is, and how much you really want to spend on it to make it the very best of that product, or you just want to get a basic model out there and see if you can sell it a little bit and then pull more money into refining it. Yeah, 1 million percent. And and that is a great way to look at it, Jim. And, and what I want people to look, also understand is, is having your product, having your inventory, doing all the right things is great, but it also has to get out in front of the right people. And that's kind of, you know, where Jim comes into play. So there's also ancillary costs. And, and we're not trying to, as Jim said, we're not trying to discourage everybody. We're just trying to let everybody know that there is costs to manufacturing and bringing a product to market. It's not one of those things that I love how Jim says it, build it and they will come. It just doesn't happen tonight, right, Jim? Yeah. And it is a, it is a process and it takes a lot of time. When you license, you basically hand all of that off to somebody else. And I'm not trying to say that people should just go out and license their ideas because again, the amount of money you could make dollar for dollar usually is a lot less with licensing than it is if you do it on your own. But if you do go it on your own, there are steps. Karma, you manufacture, you develop products. You and I do things together. It takes months even for the simplest of things. So you have to just realize you're starting a business and like any business, there's ramp up time, there's whatever it is that is in that business you're in, it doesn't just happen overnight. It takes six to 12 months to get a product developed and manufactured. And then you're gonna spend the next six to 12 months trying to sell it. So it's a couple of years before you probably will see any success. So if you're ready for that, it's fine. But the cost to doing that can really vary. And then people say, well, is there, you know, what about the cost for you, Jim? And I'm like, well, you know, it depends on what I do for you. You, I, you could pay me by the hour to pick my brain and help help you along, or I could charge you a couple thousand a month to help you sell it. But again, I'm doing all the work for you. You're sitting back while I do all the sales and marketing stuff for you. So again, to each his own, it depends on what you want to do within your own personal self, but there are costs for sure. And as long as people understand that, and how we get more exact costs is we get quotes. So I say, hey, Carmine, I've got this widget. What is it going to cost to make a mold for it? What does it cost to make each piece? And then I go to a packaging person and say, well, what does it cost to package this product? And then I present all these quotes to the inventor. And, and it's not going to be 100% accurate. It, it might vary 20 30%. But at least they have a general idea. So if they know it's going to cost them 50 grand all, all in, it could wind up costing them 40, it could wind up costing them 80. But at least they have an idea and they're not surprised. And it's like any investment, if they have a, an idea of what it costs, then they can go in with their eyes wide open, they know the risks, and then they can decide if that's what they wanna do. Yeah, it's uh, so great that we have these these podcasts because it does allow people to really think about it. Uh, you know, especially if, you know, if you're single and you have that, that extra cash laying around. But if you're not and you have a family things, it's really something to think about. You know, obviously you can do it in steps, bring on investors, family and friends or whatever that can help share those risks. It's always a good idea to do that. But then there's always the good and bad points of that. But yeah, it's uh, it, it's funny, Jim. We, you know, we do this so much, hundreds and hundreds of inventors. And it seems like every product is different, obviously, because it's an invention. But every situation with that inventor is different. Yeah, and that's, that's exactly why we can't give them an exact price. And everybody will do more or less. Some people will sell and market more. Some people will sit back. Some products are very complicated. Some are very simple. It depends on what factory makes it. It depends on who packages it. it there's so many variables that go into it. So we just hope to get them to a rough bracket of price. And again, then they can make that decision. So yeah. no, I hear you, man. All right. I, I'm sure we have time maybe for one more question. See if we can jam it in there. And this one is, I get this all the time. Do I need a patent to bring my product to market? Oh, man, you opened a can of worms with that one, dude. Oh, and I, and I have, and I have gotten a lot of backlash on social media when I 
Because I usually post, you don't need a patent. And that upsets a lot of people, especially patent attorneys or people who are in that business. But I always preface it when I start writing by saying, patents certainly have great value and can have great value. And patents can be basically necessary, especially because when you go to license, that's your leverage point. So if I go to UConn and you're a company and I have a widget and I have no patent protection at all on it and I disclose all about it, what's to stop you from saying, hey, Jim, great to meet you. We'll be in touch. And then you just go and make the thing yourself. So that's when non-disclosures and patents and that type of legality will potentially, not always, potentially protect you. But it is your leverage point. If I now come to you and say, hey, Carmen, I've got a patent pending or I've got a patent on this great new widget. Now, I'm in a much better position to do a deal with you because you now can't readily copy it so easily. Now, you can try and we can fight and that happens too, as, as we very well know. But usually, if I've got a patent on something and I approach you, the company, to do a licensing deal, if you're a good company, you're going to respect my patent and you're going to use it for your own financial gain, meaning you're going to do a licensing deal with me and you're going to you know, manufacture it and sell and market it. And you're going to give me a royalty on, on the sales for that for however many years you do a deal for. So, so in that case, a patent is a lot more valuable. But here's something that a lot of inventors don't know. In order to bring a product to retail, you do not need a patent. It's not required. In fact, most retailers never even ask about yeah. patents. All they care about is the product itself. Wow, check this out. I think we could really sell this. Is there money to be made? Is there, is there enough profit margin in it for them to sell? Can they get behind it from a marketing standpoint? I mean, I've been doing this forever. And I really can count on probably two hands how many times a retailer said, is this thing patented? Mm -hmm. Now, does it help potentially that it's patented because the retailer may feel a little bit more comfort that it won't get knocked off? Maybe, but we know products have short life cycles. Mm -hmm. So if you have something, especially if it's trendy, that's going to last a year or two, maybe three. And then there's going to be either a new and improved version of that, or somebody's going to make something somewhat similar. It's not infringing on, the, on your patent rights but it's still close enough that people say, hey, did I get something like that? No, look, now here's something that's kind of like that. Yeah. So people often mistake the term of you know, patents as, as, as if it's a complete and 100% requirement. In fact, there are savvy licensors that would be you, the inventor who license, licenses your product to a company. You're the licensor, the company is the licensee that will actually get the licensee, the company, to pay for the patents, to get them um, create, you know, to to get an application in, to and to get it, you know, the whole cost of getting a patent done. Mm -hmm. There are inventors that will do that um, because they're already having that licensee, that company, sign non disclosures that you know they could hold them to that. If the non disclosures a legal agreement that says that both parties, or in particular, the, the company you're approaching won't disclose, share, or use that information for their own personal gain or to replicate blah, 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 legal stuff. So the short answer is you do not need a patent at all. Should you have one in certain cases? Absolutely, it can, it can definitely help you. But in my world, generally speaking, when you go to retail, I really don't necessarily care. Yeah. especially if the product is something that I know is not going to be on the shelves for the next 10 years. Most things have a life cycle. We get through them, we sell them. And usually too, retailers like competition. There's almost never just one of something on a shelf. There's always, you know, we see, you know, we know Mike Van Horst, he's got that, you know, the picture hanger. Mm -hmm. The thing is awesome, right? It's really cool. Helps you hang pictures with ease, but he's not the only one with those types of devices. There's lots of uh, people just can't copy his particular device the way he has it. But there are plenty of other picture hanging devices out there that people will buy and that retailers like to offer choices. It's like if you went to a restaurant, and they just sold one thing. I mean, if you really love that thing, you'd go there and just keep getting the thing. <laughs> but, you know, you go to a restaurant and you want to have different options for things. Right. 
So even if you like the one thing you go in there for a lot, oh, you know, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try something that's like that. Like you can get a burger made 50 different ways. You can get chicken made a hundred different ways. Chicken is chicken, but you can get chicken with this on it or made that way. So inventors have to realize that it's always good to talk to a patent attorney. It's always good to understand what your legal rights would be, but you have to also be willing to defend against patent infringements. So if somebody comes along and copies your idea, even if it's patented, you got to fight them. And it can be a fortune to defend against patent infringement. And that's a whole nother discussion. And that happens to inventors occasionally. But I guess the, the whole bottom line here is that you don't need them. They're potentially good to have. And you have to look at each particular circumstance and make a decision if that's what you need to spend your money on. Jim, this is awesome. You're exactly right. Well, million percent. Uh, the thing that I like to talk about is like you said, and what we've talked about here, every circumstance is different. But what I would beg any new inventor, anyone out there that's an inventor, please, and I say, please, please, please do not go out and ask your patent attorney what the best thing to do is first. Okay. And patent attorneys are great. Jim and I both know hundreds of patent attorneys. They also do trademarks and and all kinds of stuff that you need. It's just that if you ask a patent attorney what you should do, they're going to say, get a patent. Just like if I go to the dentist, tell him my foot hurts, he's going to work on my teeth. The trick is, is to do not get a patent first thing because me as a designer and a manufacturer, I can guarantee you that your idea is going to change through iterations. So even if you want to get a patent, you should wait. There's a sequence involved. So please don't spend five or $10,000 on a patent when you could take that money and design and develop your product first. There's ways to protect it without getting that patent in the first step. Yeah, again, it's just before you do anything, before you spend money, talk to one of us. Just learn what your options are. Learn the risks and rewards and the potential payoffs and you know, the procedures, it's, it's like anything you do. You want to do a little research. You want to do your homework. You want to be educated on the process. And we'll never tell you definitively, like, you have to do this. It'll be more like, this is what you, I think you should do based on us doing this for decades. This is the likely outcome. And then it's up to you to decide if that's how you want to proceed. Yeah, I agree. I've, I've had products that came into my office patented with just an idea, just a drawing, and by the time we finished, the patent was obsolete because the product changed through its iterations. By the time we had to manufacture it, the patent or, or we our hands were held in creating it correctly or creating it at a low cost or whatever, because the patent wouldn't allow us to do that. So it's uh, it's very good that you get all of your options. As Jim said, we would love to sit down talk to you about your options, which way you think you go. And then, you know, with a clear head and a clear plan, put everything into performance, which man, it really not only say, and, and, you know, people have all the money in the world, but this saves time and man, time to market, right, Jim, it's important. Yeah. I mean, you can get hung up. That's the thing. People go it alone. They spend three months, six months doing it incorrectly. And then they come to us and want us to fix it. We Sometimes we have to just start all over them. Mm -hmm. And now they've lost all that time. And almost always that lost time coincides with lost money because they're spending money to do all these things and they're doing it incorrectly because they get excited. Yeah. yeah, we know. It's tough. You gotta yeah. be careful for sure and be ready to explore your options correctly. I hear you, man. That's all good stuff. I, I love these questions because we get them all the time. So what's the retail outlook, man, for the next uh, several months? It seems like it's picking uh, up. It is. People are, again, even though some retail stores close a little earlier or limit how many people can come in. When I'm out and about just doing my normal stuff, stores look basically the same. The shelves look the same. The amount of things that are being sold look the same. I remember at Christmas time, the stores were packed. And the malls were packed. And I, I know that retail numbers weren't as great as they could be, but online they were crazy good. So I think, again, people are getting used to things. There's a vaccine out now. I think hopefully by the time we get to this holiday, it will be more normal as we know it. I think people are still going to shop regardless. They're going to get it online. They're going to get it in the store. Somehow, some way they're going to 
keep living and doing the things they want to do now that we've been through sort of a year with everything and people are just, you know, look, just wear a mask. And other than that, they're trying to live normally as the best they can. Yeah, I think so. I think it's coming around and uh, you know, you want to be on the forefront when the wave hits, because yes. I think once everybody escapes their house and starts doing stuff, they're, they're going to really <laughs> go a little bit crazy, which, you know, uh, I can't blame them. Yeah. I mean, people want to shop, they want to get out and they want to, I know online's a big deal, but people like to get out and be in a physical store. They want to touch and feel products and try stuff on and test it. There's just something about that, that even though we talk about how big the internet is, retail is just never going to go away. People want that experience. And if our kids are in stores and they are shopping at certain stores that they like, then that whole next generation is definitely going to be retail shopping as much as they buy online. They still want that retail experience. Yeah. You've always said that. And I, and I agree. I mean, that retail, that's why retail will never die. It might change. They might reconfigure the stores or mm -hmm. be a hybrid. But as you said, I agree. Retail is not going to die. I mean, people just love yeah. going to the stores. Even if you're going to walk around. Yeah. Know? <laughs> right. Just to get out. All right. You can't just sit in your house and shop for everything. Well, there are people that do that, but I know I don't want to be one of those people. I like to see all the different things and some things you just can't buy online, like clothes or whatever. Yeah. All good, man. I love it. Well, listen, Jim, as usual, man, thank you so much for spending some yeah. time for our listeners out there. We really appreciate it because, you know, this is uh, information that they're just not going to get. We're not trying to uh, sell you. We're just trying to give you information to make the best decisions possible. We're here for you. If you have any questions, we'd love to hear from you. Send in some um, questions or reviews. We'd love to know what you would need to hear about. We definitely, um, you know, reach out to Jim. He's on social media, jimdebetta.com. And we're on YouTube now, Carmen. We got uh, we our YouTube channel. Yeah, we are on YouTube, the Launch Network on youtube uh you know before we never had our videos now people are gonna see uh start watching us yeah now we gotta like dress up a little bit nicer <laughs> that's the scary know. part <laughs> i i used to just uh i used to be able to wear my pajamas to, doing these podcasts I'm, now I'm I, wear, I wear what i wear I, you know my <laughs> people they're, they're here for the they're here for the information right if we're yeah, you know, if yeah. i'm not wearing a suit that's for sure so we have been getting some great reviews for people you know uh, you know, if we can help one person with each show, it's, it's, it's a, it's a home run for us, but we've been yes. getting some great stuff. Um, anyone out there, please. Uh, Jim's an ambassador for the United Vendors Association. Uh, I'm on the board of United Vendors Association. Please go on out and join uh, the UIA. Uh, it's free and uh, a lot of resources there also. UIA.org. UIAUSA.org. And uh, for myself, Carmen Disco, for Mr. Jim DeBetta, we thank you for listening. And we will catch you next time on Get to Retail Ready. You all take care.